creation cries to you worshiping in spirit and in truth glory to the faithful one jesus christ god's son our creation gives you praise you alone are truly great you alone are god who reigns for eternity god is great and his praise fills the earth it fills the heavens and your name will be praised through all the world god is great sing his praise all the earth and all the heavens cause we're living for the glory of your name the glory of your name All to you, O oh God, we bring. Jesus, teach us how to live. Let your fire burn in us, that all may hear, and that all may see that God is great and his praise fills the earth it fills the heavens and your name will be praised through all the world god is great sing his praise all the earth and all the heavens cause we're living for the glory of your name the glory of your name Yes, the glory of your name. So holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. The whole earth sings. The whole earth sings. Holy is the Lord. The whole sings holy holy is the lord the whole earth sings the whole earth sings holy is the lord the whole earth sings the whole earth sings God is great and his praise fills the earth, it fills the heavens and your name will be praised through all the world. God is great, so sing his praise, all the earth and all the heavens, cause we're living for the glory of your name. Yes, we're living for the glory of your name, the glory of your name. Everybody? Whoa. Welcome everybody this morning. It's good to, to be together. It's good to see some faces we haven't seen for a while. Welcome to everybody uh, watching online at home. Um, we're glad that we can all be able to come together and be able to worship together this morning um, and just and, and uh, sing our praises to God just as, as we were singing. A um, couple announcements for you. Uh, one is next week, um, the, uh, the, uh, the youth group will be having a Super Bowl party, um, so you can uh, talk to Stephen if you want more information about that. 
Um, and then also, um, if you didn't see the email I sent out this week, um, we're working to try to, to connect people in the congregation for the year. And, and the way we're doing that is that um, we're wanting to connect households in prayer. Um, and so if we're, whoever would like to be a part of that, um, you can uh, send me an email or send Gail an email or just talk to us and let us know. Um, but we're going to pair up uh, different households. And I should clarify, um, there was some confusion when I said households. I, I specifically use the words households uh, to not just mean families, but, you know, a household can be a household of one or a household can be a household of 15. Um, but um, whatever it is, we want everybody, uh, we, I would love everybody to be a part of it. And, and, and so we're going to pair um, households up of those that want to be a part of it. Um, and then throughout the year, you're kind of committed to pray for one another. So you'll kind of be in contact with each other at least monthly um, and, you know, talking through what's going on and what your your household uh, would need prayer for or like prayer for and committing to pray um, for other households as well. So um, if you have more questions about that or you'd like to be a part of that, let me know or let Gail know. Um, and I'm excited for that as a way for us to be able to, to uh, connect with each other more and pray more, which are two things that I think are awesome for us to do. Um, and so, yeah. I think with that in mind, let's pray, and then we'll continue into worship. Uh, God, I just thank you, God, that your glory fills the earth and fills the heavens, God. God, I confess that I can just go through my days, go through my life, and just not notice it, God. Just be um, yeah, careless and, 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 and fail to notice you, fail to notice you at work, um, and God, I want to have eyes that see your glory, that see you at work. I want us to be a church that sees your glory and sees you at work. And so I just pray that you would open our eyes, that we would see you at work, God. Um, I pray that this time this morning that, that we've set aside just to commit to worship to you, that we really would be able to focus on you and focus on that, and that we would see and worship you for all who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> All right, let's stand and continue to sing and praise the Lord this morning. <coughs> the line of Judah, the lamb who was slain. You ascended to heaven and evermore will reign. At the end of the age, when the earth you reclaim, you will gather the nations before you. And the eyes of all men will be fixed on the lamb who was crucified. With wisdom and mercy and justice, you'll reign at your Father's side. And the angels will cry, Hail the Lamb, who was slain for the world, ruling power. And the earth will reply, you shall reign as the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. There's a shield in our hand and a sword at our side. There's a fire in our spirits that cannot be denied. Because the Father has told us for these you have died. For the nations that gather before you And the ears of all men need to hear Of the Lamb who was crucified Who descended to hell yet was raised up To reign at his Father's side And the angels will cry Hail the Lamb slain for the world, ruling power. And the earth will reply, you shall reign as the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And the angels will cry, hail the Lamb. 
was slain for the world ruling power and the earth will reply you shall reign as the king of all kings and the lord of all lords you're the king of all kings and the lord of all Wonderful 
counselor we will adore you have created us God evermore we adore you we adore Lord of the infinite, author of time, earth and the heavens sing your grand design. Angels in worship rejoice and proclaim. God, we thank you just for that deep and abiding love that we have from you, God. That Father's love that you have for us, God. 
God, I know that um, there's times that I can be disappointed with my children or, or frustrated or even angry, God. But God, as I, as I tell them all the time, there's nothing that they could do that would make me just stop loving them. And God, we thank you for that love that you have for us. That there's nothing that we could do that would make you to stop loving us, God. May we just really know that and be convinced of that. And not in a way that just that allows us to just do whatever we want, but in a way that draws us to you and draws us to our Father and makes us more like him. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Carol. Um, if you'd like to worship this morning by giving, you can do so at bcfgiving.churchcenter.com. Um, if you're watching online for the first time or visiting for the first time, um, we're not necessarily asking you to give. We think supporting what we do here is the work of the church, but we want to be able to worship God in, in this way, in the way that we use our finances. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and dismiss kids for Kids Church. So walking through seven back in the primary room. <laughs> Uh, trying to sort out, we're having a little bit of issue with getting our controls to work remotely uh, for our slides that we usually use, and so there's a little disconnect between uh, what you see. You can go ahead and get the first slide up there, Simon, um, before what you see and uh, what you, yeah, what, uh, and what I'm talking about. It's just a little bit off, not, not the way we're having to usually do it, so sorry about that. <coughs> And sorry if I still have a little bit of a cough. It's gotten better from last week. Like I said, I did have COVID a few weeks ago. I'm not contagious if I'm coughing. I'll try not to spew stuff out there. But if I accidentally do, it's not, don't, you don't need to be concerned. It's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not contagious anymore. It's been long enough. All right. Um, is this going to work now? No, it's not. Okay. Give up on it. Uh, just go with it, Justin. Just roll with the punches. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Um, so we're going to continue in the book of Hebrews uh, today. Um, and the book of Hebrews, um, we, uh, you know, we've just been in it for a couple weeks now. And the book of Hebrews you know, talks about the greatness of Jesus. And, and last week we, we looked, um, and it was a more heavily theological message as we kind of looked at the, how the greatness of Jesus is described. We looked at the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity that we believe in, of, of how God is, is three persons in one. Um, and, uh, and, and we, we kind of explored that, and, and, and I encourage you just to kind of reflect on the greatness of God, that, that you know, we said that that wasn't a heavy practical uh, sermon in the way of, like, this, this is how you go live your life and everything, but, but it has all sorts of implications for how we live our life, recognizing who God is, seeing who He is, seeing Him for the fullness of who He is. Um, and so if you, if you missed that last week, you can go back and listen to that. Um, but this week, as we go through Hebrews, it's going to be a lot more practical um, because uh, the, the author of Hebrews is going to be drawing out the conclusions. Like, if Jesus is so great, if Jesus is uh, who we say he is, if he's all these things, then what uh, do we do about that and how do we respond from that? And so let's go ahead and open up uh, to Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll start right there in verse 1. And it says, Therefore, we must pay close, much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Right? So he says, if it's true that Jesus is, is, uh, is, is greater than angels, if it's true that Jesus rules over everything, if it's true that Jesus is greater than God, if it's true that Jesus is our means of salvation, all those things we talked about last week, if those things are true, pay close attention. Pay close attention. We talked about that in the very first week in Hebrews that he opened up with, with saying that God spoke and formulated through the prophets, but he's spoken now through Jesus. Listen 
to him. Pay close attention. Be intentional with your life so that you don't drift away. And so that's our first thing we see from this day is pay attention that you do not drift away. Get that point up there, Simon? Pay attention that you do not drift away. Live intentionally with your life. Watch closely. Keep a watch out that you don't drift away. And this, this word drift away, um, just like it does in English and Greek, has the same kind of uh, connotation that can be talking about a ship out at sea, a ship that misses its port, that passes by um, or, or goes by where it's not supposed to be, that, that a ship that, that goes by where it's not supposed to be. Um, and with that kind of in mind, I think there's three ways that, that we can drift away. Um, and to illustrate these, uh, I want to tell you the, the story about this ship named Alta. So go ahead, Simon. Uh, so the ship named Alta. So Alta was a merchant ship that was built in 1976. Um, in, 20, in 2018, while it was sailing across the Atlantic, which was not really a ship that was made to really do that uh, uh, and everything, but the, the engines failed on the ship, and so the crew was stranded out at sea. And so um, they were able to get help. The U.S. Coast Guard was able to go and evacuate the ship, but it left the ship drifting out at sea. Um, and it became something uh, that I didn't know this was a, a real term. Some of you, you guys are all like more boat people around here because you're from around here. But it became a ghost ship. I thought a ghost ship was just like, you know, in legends of the ghost ship that would come. But, but a ghost ship, if you don't know, is actually just a derelict, derelict trip. Derelict trip? Derelict a boat, <laughs> a boat that's drifting, <laughs> a boat that's drifting and caught in the currents and the winds and the waves and is, is being blown about the sea, unoccupied, unmanned, uncontrolled, unsteered. It's just going wherever the currents take it. And I think that this is a picture of one of the ways that we can drift away. That, that, that like the, the boat, we, our lives can become unmanned, that we can become complacent. Uh, in our spiritual life. So the first, uh, first way that we can drift away is from complacency. Simon? We can become like the ghost ship, caught up in the waves and the currents and the things that surround us, just drifting from here to there, not really set or focused or anchored anywhere. Right? We get moved by the currents of our culture around us. We can, we can get blown about by, by, by the morality of, of the world rather than the morality that comes from, from uh, studying who God is and what, what He wants. We can, we can be tossed about um, and, and taken away just by the, 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 the currents that are going on in our lives around us and our families and our world and our city and our culture. Whatever it is, like we can get caught up in the winds of the world around us and just drift from here to there, sometimes closer to where we're supposed to be, sometimes farther away, but we drift and drift. And if you, that picture you saw of the altar that I showed you, eventually the altar, it, it, it got it swept up um, and it came and, 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 and hit some rocks on the shore of Ireland. It got caught up in the rocks and that's where it is. That's two years ago and it's still there today and they're trying to figure out how they're going to dismantle it or what they're going to do with it. But ultimately the ship is destroyed because it was just left adrift at sea and ended up shipwrecked. For many of us, when we came to, to faith in Christ, when we came to know Jesus, we were passionate about our faith. We were passionate about uh, what God had done in our life. We were passionate about the hope that we had and, 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 and who we'd seen God to be. But, but we can get so just tossed about by the world around us. We can get so caught up in the things going around, around us that we end up adrift at sea, drifting far from Him. And what Hebrews reminds us is to, to look closely at your life. He says, pay close attention, right? The way that we don't end up at complacent is that we're paying close attention, that we're, we're, we're intentionally living our lives and not drifting away from God, not drifting away from who uh, he, we know who He is and who He's called us to be. So that's one way we drift away. Another way, um, so I have another ship here. This is the, the Costa Concordia. A lot of you probably remember this story. Um, in 2012, so the Costa Concordia was a cruise ship, um, and it was operating in the Mediterranean. Um, and one day in January, it was uh, sailing along the Italian coastline, and 
um, the captain of the ship had invited some guests up into the, into the bridge uh, with him and some of the other crew members and, and wasn't paying uh, close attention, was paying more attention to his guests, include, which one of those guests included his mistress. Um, and he was talking with them and, 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 and uh, conversing with them and wasn't uh, paying attention that the ship had drifted slightly off course. And then, next picture, Simon. It hit some rocks, uh, tipped, uh, sunk, tipped over. You can see it here. 32 people lost their lives in this disaster. Um, they estimated the cost from like, um, uh, that the, the company had to pay uh, as far as like um, settlements with, with families and, and the raising, you know, like the salvage of the ship and the, um, the fixing like what had gotten messed up in the harbor there. All of that ended up costing $2 billion, um, all because the captain was a little bit distracted when he was driving. And that's, I think, the second way that we can end up uh, drifting in our faith in Jesus is distraction, right? We live in a world full of distractions. It becomes so easy throughout the day. I just always check my phone, check my phone, check to see, uh, check, uh, like, what emails I have, who's, who's done one on Facebook, right? Uh, what messages do I have? Check, 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 right? Or, or I can just have on demand, I can have anything I want at any time, uh, pretty much. And, and, and so my life is, is, is constantly distracting me. My life, I can constantly be entertained if I want to. I can have almost anything I want ex- uh, when I want it uh, in, in our culture that we live in today. And it becomes easy to be distracted, to take my eyes off where I'm supposed to be going, of where I'm supposed to be sailing, even for an instant. Right, we all have uh, the 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 experience if you drive of, of you're driving in your car and you go to look over and you accidentally pull the wheel with you, right? And the, the whole car moves with you. anybody anybody here relate to that? <laughs> yeah, and you cartwheel through a field. Uh, right, like you 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 look you take your eyes off. You don't feel like you're going any different. You don't. You don't notice it. It's imperceptible until you look off and realize, I'm off course. I've changed the direction that I'm going. I've taken my eyes off where they're supposed to be, and I've lost the direction I'm supposed to be going. I've lost the direction I want to be headed in my life. This happens in our our Christian life as well. There's, There's so many things that we can get distracted by. Not all bad things, right? Like, like comfort, sex, money, entertainment, sports, family, relationships. These things aren't, aren't necessarily bad things, but they can become our focus. They can become what drives us. They can take, uh, take our eyes off from paying close attention that we don't drift away. We can start paying attention to these other things, and before long, we're off course. You know, we talk about the car situation. It's pretty easy because you're either off the road or you catch yourself and you get right back on the road. But if you're, you're in the boat in the middle of an ocean and you get slightly off course, you may get, uh, before you realize your mistake, you can deviate long and far away. Just an inch off course can take you miles out in another direction. And this is true of our faith as well. When we lose sight of who God has called us to be, when we get distracted by the concerns and cares of the world, when we let those things become the focus of our minds, focus of our lives, the the things that we're investing our time, our energy, those things that we are paying close attention to, when we let those things become our focus, it pulls us way off course. Hebrews is later going to say to us, fix your eyes on Jesus. Pay close attention to him so that you do not become distracted. So that's a, another way. There's, a, there's a, another way, and this is probably the most famous ship uh, wreck that, that, that we know of. So next picture, Simon. So that's funny. It didn't show up on mine. All right, the, the, uh, anybody know what ship that is? The Titanic, right? And we're all pretty familiar with the Titanic. You know, our hearts will all go on and everything. Uh, about 1,500 people lost their lives. Um, and, and, you know, what's striking to the, about the story of the Titanic is just how much it's a story of human hubris and pride, right? You know, as we, we all know that the ship was thought to be unsinkable. Um, the, 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 because the ship was thought to be unsinkable, when there was reports of ice in the area, 
uh, that they weren't heated. People just said, oh, we don't, the, the, we don't need to worry about that. We, we're in the Titanic. We're not going to sink. And this kept on going. The, the owner of the ship was aboard and, and pressing them to go full speed uh, so that they could make a record uh, time with the biggest ship and impress everybody um, because they, in their pride, they thought that they, they, they did not need to heed the warnings. They thought that they could accomplish uh, something more because of the ship that they had built. Right before the trip, lifeboats were removed because they thought they would be unnecessary and the deck was too cluttered with them. And as a result, they had only enough lifeboats um, for, for about half the capacity of the ship. Um, and even when, when, people, when the lifeboats were hauled out, some people didn't get into them because they, they, the pride of, we're on an unsinkable ship. We don't need to get in the lifeboats. It's cold out there. And, and, and uh, 1,500 people lost their lives. Right? The, the, the pride... The hubris led them to an, uh, an attitude of defiance. Other ships need to heed the, the, the warnings of, of the ice, but we don't need to heed them. And this is the third way I think that we can drift away from God is that we can act in defiance. We want to be the rulers of our lives. We know better than God what is best for us. It, other things might impact other people, but it won't touch me. It won't affect me. And we act in pride and defiance, thinking that, that we do not need to listen to God. We do not need to listen to others. We do not need to listen to those people that God has put into our life to speak truth to us. We can act in our own way. And we keep piloting our ship towards destruction. We know the choices we're making, we know uh, what the results can be, but we fail to heed the warnings because we think they don't apply to us. And so, in all of these things, whether it's from, uh, it's from drifting, uh, from, from complacency, or distraction, or defiance, the verse tells us, go back, go back to the verse, Simon, and it, tell, it reminds us to pay close attention. Whoops, I guess I didn't put it up there. This is for the next verse. But pay close attention. Don't forsake your first love. Remember that, uh, remember that this all flows from what we talked about uh, last week. Because Jesus is greater, because of what Jesus has done, <coughs> pay attention that you don't drift away because he is worth it. And because not uh, paying uh, attention will, uh, and drifting away will lead to disaster, which is where the passage goes next. It says, uh, For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Um, so uh, last, if you remember last week in the passage, it was talking about how Jesus is greater than angels. And so, um, and now we see why it, why it's talking about angels. So that when it says this message declared by angels proved to be, unreliable, or proved to be reliable, um, the message declared by angels, what that's talking about is in Jewish uh, thinking at that time and Christian thinking at that time, the message given to Moses of like the Ten Commandments and the law for the people, the instruction. We, we say law, but really a better translation of that word is instruction. The instruction given to to God's people, was thought to have been mediated to Moses through angels. And so what he's saying is, um, if that message, mediated through angels, if, if that message of, of, of God's uh, law in the Old Testament, if that is reliable, and if in that, that instruction, in that, less, uh, that message, every transgression or obedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? He's saying, so if that's true, that there was punishment, that the people face punishment, right? And we see that in the law. There's, there was individual uh, consequences, individual uh, punishment that happened if people transgressed the law. Um, and depending on what the law was that they were broke, that broke there was different uh, penalties and everything. But then there was also like a corporate penalty for God's people as well, that if as a people you failed to, diso uh, to obey God's instruction, as a people, if you failed to, to care for the, the, the orphan, the widow, and the foreigner, as a people, if you uh, continued to worship other gods, as a people, if you, if you did not heed God's instruction, then there was, uh, there was punishment for that. 
So there's both individual and, and a corporate thing that happened. He's saying, if that was true, then how much more is it true for us, right? And the, in the opening Hebrews, he talks about there's the message that's declared by angels, and then there's the message uh, that God spoke through his son, through Jesus, the greater message. And if there was punishment for disobeying the, the simpler message, then there's definitely going to be punishment for, and consequences for disobeying the greater message. And we have to see that he's not talking to unbelievers here, right? This isn't like a fire and brimstone message of, so you better uh, put your, your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ, that he is, uh, this, this, this letter or sermon, whatever you want to call it, was written to Christians. And he's saying to them, be careful not to drift away because there's consequences for drifting away. And that's our next point. There are consequences for drifting away. Got that, Simon? Just like drifting away in a ship leads to disaster, if we drift away in our relationship to Christ, it leads to disaster in our life. It leads to hurt. It leads to heartache. It leads to loneliness and emptiness. It leads to destruction in our life. Probably most of us that have, have been Christians for a long time have seen that in our life. We've had times where we've drifted away and we've experienced the hurt and the destruction that comes from that. You know, and you know, some people might say, "Oh, this is just a this is a way to control people, just to to say, uh, you know, like you better follow Jesus, or bad things are going to happen to you." And that's not the point of it, right? If it's loving to warn people when they're in danger. Right, if a, a lighthouse is put up to protect a ship from running into the rocks, no one would say, "Oh, the lighthouse is there to can try to control people." Like it's good for there to be a warning. It's good for there to be something that's that's going to stop it. And so for us, or the writer of Hebrews to say this, for us to say this, um, it, it's a loving thing, not a, not a hateful thing. It's not about control. But I believe that we were created to live uh, 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 peace with one another and, and to be uh, at peace with God's creation. We are created for a greater purpose. And when we don't live that out, when we don't obey God, when we don't follow his instruction, when we don't follow the message of the gospel that we say we proclaim, then there is going to be, the result of that is going to be hurt and pain uh, and, and destruction in our lives. For, for those of us that have, that have been Christians for a while, we've all seen cases of people, maybe even experienced ourselves, but seeing cases of people that, that were on fire for God, but, but whether through complacency or distraction or defiance or all three, we've seen their lives become shipwrecked and destroyed from drifting away from the gospel. Now, a lot of people, when they read uh, this verse that we just read in Hebrews, um, and, and, so, and recognizing that it's written to Christians, ask the question, so, so is he saying that uh, you can lose your salvation? Like, is he saying that, 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 <coughs> that the con- is he inferring that the consequence that we'll face is a loss of salvation? You know, as Christians, um, this is an important question, because as Christians we say that our salvation is not based upon the good work we do, right? We never, we don't make ourselves good enough for God, but it's through trust in Jesus, through the work that Jesus did on the cross and in his resurrection um, that, that allows us to be in relationship with God. And so if that's true, like, can our actions, our drifting away, lead us to lose our salvation? Because that seems a little bit backwards. Um, and that's a really good question to ask. Um, but it's not a question that we're going to answer today. Um, and the reason that, there's a couple reasons. One is that there's actually several passages like this in Hebrews and, and some that are a little bit more explicit. And so we'll deal with that um, when we get to those passages. Um, but there's another reason that I don't really want to deal with it today. One is like, like on well, just a pra- like more practical level, is like we were really heady and theological last week. I don't want to get heady and theological this week. But also, too, if you go back to the verse, actually, can you go back to that verse, Simon? If you look at the verse, like it's pretty vague about what he's talking about, right? Is he talking about salvation here? I don't know, right? Like, you could, you could read it that way, but you could also read it not. And so you have to put it in the context of all of theology and stuff like that, which, uh, and everything. But I don't think really his point, well, um, 
I, I don't think that, that, I think that if we reduce this to just being about salvation, then we're missing the point, right? Um, like, <clears throat> I think what he wants us to avoid here is the error of thinking, well, I'm saved by the work of Christ. I'm not saved by my good works. And so it doesn't matter what I do, right? That's erroneous thinking for us to think as, as a Christian. Like, I'm saved by, by, by the work of Christ, and so what I do doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter for our salvation, but it does matter. The things that we do do matter. And when we fail to live in a way uh, of Christ and his kingdom, there are consequences for that, whether we're saved or not. That, 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 that sin in our lives, even after we've accepted Christ, leads to death and destruction. Right? And if we read this passage and we, and we ask a question and we're, we're thinking, well, you know, can I drift away um, uh, and still be saved? I think it's not really the question that, that we're supposed to be asking, right? That it's not the point like, um, uh, well, how close can I get? How much can I drift away and still be saved? Right? We're missing the point there when we do that. I have another ship to tell you about here. This is a fascinating week for me, just digging into all these shipping disasters. So this next ship is the Mount Blanc. And the Mount Blanc um, in, in 1917 was loaded with like 3,000 tons of explosives um, to, I, I'm uh, supposed to go to France, I'm assuming, like, for the war effort in France. But it was loaded up in New York, and it was supposed to meet up with a convoy of ships in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, and when it was getting uh, uh, close to Halifax, um, uh, it, was, it was sailing along, and it, and it saw another ship coming along, right? Uh, and, and the part of the bay that the ship, other ship wasn't supposed to be. And so the, the, the Mount Blanc sounded a, a, a toot on his horn uh, to warn the other ship. And then the other ship uh, sent back, I don't know all the shipping stuff, but assuming this is true, this is accurate, the other ship sent back a mar, mar, saying, no, nope, I'm not, like a two blast saying, I'm not changing my course, uh, uh, you, you, you change your course. And so the, the captain of the Mount Blanc um, did cha- uh, turn off the engines at that point and try to veer away, sounded their horn once more, mar, and the other ship, the Emo, uh, kept going and sounded its, its horn again, mar, mar. Um, and then as the ships got closer, the, the emo realized uh, that it was really not uh, doing the right thing, turned off its uh, engines as well. And so these ships had like the slowest collision ever of like a mile per hour collision. But next picture, Simon, it still caused a huge explosion as all of those munitions that were aboard uh, the Mount Blanc ignited. There was a, the blast radius was like a half mile out in each direction. Next picture, Simon, uh, 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 killed nearly, what was it, uh, 2,000 people in Halifax, 9,000 people were injured, like trees were knocked down, buildings were leveled, uh, all, all because of this. Now, so whose fault was it that these ships crashed? Was it the Mount Blanc or the Emo? Huh? The Emo? Yeah, most of us think, like, yeah, oh, the Emo... It's like that guy, that, that, that emo guy was a jerk. Like, <laughs> like he just kept going and it didn't, didn't heed the warnings. But um, at least one of the inquiries into the ship um, fell into responsibility with the Mount, or into the accident, uh, found uh, responsibility with the Mount Blanc. Um, and their reasoning was the Mount Blanc knew the load it was carrying. It knew the danger that was uh, posed by any type of collision. Um, and so it should have done everything in its power uh, to avoid that collision and 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 and, uh, and and did it and failed to do that and so um, uh, that so what's the point of all this? We take the danger that we know about seriously. We take the danger of drifting seriously. We take the danger of destruction seriously. We don't ask the question: How much can I drift away from God? How far can I get in my relationship with Him? How much? Can I get blown about by the currents of the world or go after this distraction or live the way I want to? We don't ask, how much of that can I do and still be saved? Because then we're not taking seriously the danger that's posed by drifting. We're not taking seriously what we know and what we say we believe about sin. Right? If we truly believe the gospel message, we think that, that we realize the destructive nature of sin. We've seen and experienced the destructive nature of sin in our life. 
We've seen the destructive nature of sin in the world. We've seen the destructive nature of sin in other people's lives. We know the danger that there is in drifting, the danger that we can bring to our own lives and to the lives of people around us from drifting. And so we do everything in our power to avoid drifting. We do everything in our power to pay careful attention not to drift because we know the destruction that drifting can bring in our lives and the world lives around us. And that's, I think, the point of this, this in Hebrews is, and that's why I think it's important for us not just to, to go so quickly to, well, is this talking about can we lose our salvation? In and, and one sense, it doesn't matter if it's talking about if we can lose our salvation or not. Now, obviously, in, in the whole understanding of what salvation is and stuff, it matters. But in how we live our lives, it really doesn't matter because our mindset should be, how can I at all costs avoid bringing sin and destruction into my life? How can I at all costs avoid bringing sin and destruction to the world around me? How can I at all costs live out and pay careful attention to this gospel message that I have received? All right, and this, uh, this gospel message we received is, is where he goes in the last part of this, this passage. So if you want to go to the next verse, Simon. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was tested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders, in various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So he talks about how the message of, of hope that we have, the gospel message that we have, that we proclaim, it first came through Jesus, and then went to his followers, um, and, then, uh, and then was uh, verified as, as, as the, the Holy Spirit empowered his church with with signs and wonders and with gifts and powers that, 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 um, that the message, the gospel message of Jesus and the good news of who Jesus was and what he was and the good news of God's kingdom uh, was confirmed. And so what we see from this, you know, in this context of what he's talking about here of, of being careful not to drift away is that we are careful not to drift away because of the power and truth of the message. We have this next point, Simon. We're careful not to drift away because of the power and and truth of the message we have received. I often talk about the gospel message not being to you alone, right? That it's the gospel message is not Christ died for just you, right? That the gospel message is something bigger than that. The gospel message is that Christ died to redeem creation and he invites you to be a part of that. And so he died for you in the sense of uh, that he wants you to be a part of it, but it's bigger than you. It's greater than you. The God who created the world, the God who maintains and sustains the world is recreating it. And he wants you to be a part of that. He wants you, the king whose kingdom is in rebellion, wants you to be a part of of proclaiming the good news of, 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 of what the kingdom looks like when it's not in a rebellion and calling those to submit to his kingship. He has called us to a greater message. He's called us to a greater hope. He's called us to something greater. You know, why should we be careful not to drift away? Because what we have, what we are called to, is more compelling than anything that can pull us away. What in this world is greater than, than the message of the gospel? What in the world is greater than the message of hope that, that Christ came to fix all things, that Christ came to repair what's broken in the world, and that he invites you to partake in that? He invites, invites you to participate in that. He invites you to proclaim that both with your life and with your words, that, that he wants you to be a part of that. What greater thing can there be? So maybe this morning you're feeling convicted, like we all have these temptations to drift away, we all get lax in our relationship with God, we all get distracted by things in the world around us, we all have times where we willfully say, I'm going to do things my way and not God's way. But when you're in a ship, how do you keep a ship from drifting? I'll give you a hint here. What is this? An anchor, right? An anchor. And the anchor goes to the bottom of the ocean. 
and it keeps the, it keeps the ship tied down. Now, have you ever been in a boat with an anchor tie that's, that's got an anchor down? And then you're in that boat, and you, and you sometimes feel the ship start to drift a little bit, right? And then you feel the tug. Whoops, I'm too strong to tug. I can't tug the anchor hard. But you feel the tug of the anchor, and you feel the boat kind of pull back towards that anchor a little bit, right? It's not always easy to know when you're drifting. I remember when I was in middle school, I went with my friend, and I went to visit his uncle in San Diego, and I was out swimming, and I was like, oh, you know, I hadn't been out the ocean that much, and so I wanted to swim out past the breakers and everything, and I think I had a boogie board or something, I don't really remember real well, but I swam out past the breakers, and I was playing out there, just oblivious, and all of a sudden, this teenage lifeguard comes back, comes up to me using a life, uh, you know, using the backstroke, throws me the ring, I'm like, why are you throwing this to me? I'm not drowning or anything, and he's like, you're caught in a riptide. I was like, what's a riptide? <laughs> a riptide is a tide that's, a current that's taking you out to sea, uh, and so I, I felt actually pretty embarrassed at the time because I was like, eight, I was eighth grade, so I, uh, and, and this was like a little teenager. He was like shorter than me, but obviously like much buffer than me and everything. So I was a little embarrassed that this little guy rescued me. But anyway, he, he pulled me back in, and, and you know, I was blissfully unaware of the danger I was in. It's not always easy to know when you're caught up in a current. It's not always easy to know when you're being pulled away from, from, uh, from the gospel. It's not e- always easy to know when you're being pulled away from Jesus. And yet Jesus is the anchor of our soul. I believe as Christians, if we're paying close attention, that we're going to feel that tug from him. We're going to feel the tug like, hey, what are you doing right now? It's not right. Hey, you're not really paying attention to me right now. You're getting distracted by this thing or that thing. It's not even close to to the value of the gospel. We are going to feel the tug of the anchor of our soul at our heart, calling us away from our drifting. And so, like, the challenge is, as we move into our communion time and have some time to reflect this morning is, is, are you feeling that tug right now in your life? Is there something in your life that is distracting you? Is there ways in your life that you've just become complacent in your spiritual life? Are you directing your eyes to Jesus? You know, I don't like just stop talking about, like, read your Bible and pray as like, oh, those are the good things for us to do, but those are the things that help to keep our eyes fixed on our anchor. Those are the, the, the ways that we can feel that tug of the anchor in our soul. Are we spending time, not just going through the motions, but really spending time with God, seeing who he is, fixing our eyes on him? Are we letting what he says to us, uh, are we obeying it? Are we living it out? Are we following that or are we drifting farther and farther from him? And so my, my encouragement to you this morning is as we move into that time is just to, to take some time to reflect, like, are you tugging at my soul, God? Am I caught in a current I'm unaware of? Or maybe a current I'm very aware of. I'm, I'm living defiantly, God, but help bring me back to you. Tug me back to you. Let's fix our eyes on him. And so let's uh, reflect on that as we move into our communion time. So Kale and Joe, if you guys want to come on up. So you can send um, someone up uh, from each group. And we have little prepackaged communion cups with wafers and juice in them. And uh, we'll hand them out to you for, for each group. And you can take them back to your seats and then hold them. And we'll take them together in a couple minutes. And let's reflect on where your heart is and if you're adrift at sea right now.
Can you put up the, there's another slide of our, just there's the title for you. So our message series is called Greater, right? Um, and the point is that in Hebrews that, that talks about the greatness of Jesus. He is greater than anything else. And the semi message is greater than those things that tug at us, that pull us away, that make us drift. It's greater than that. And I stress, you know, the, the it's not all about you. The gospel's not all about you. But that does not change the greatness of the love that he personally does feel about each of you. Just like in my own family. I don't want my kids to think that our family's all about them or the world's all about them. But it doesn't change the fact that for each one of my children, I have a great and personal love. Christ has a great and personal love one of us greater than any love that you've experienced in your life greater than any love that you could chase after in your life Christ has a greater love for you than all of that greater love has no man than this that he would lay down his life for his brother and so Jesus we thank you for the greatness of your love that you love is greater and deeper than anyone. That your love is truer and purer than any of the ways that, that we seek love or fulfillment in this world. Jesus, you are greater. And as we eat this bread, remember, you showed the greatness of your love. just like there's no greater love than what was shown to us through Jesus. There's no greater calling or purpose that we can have than to be a part of his kingdom. And we thank you that you have called us for something more. That you shed your blood so that we can be a part of your great kingdom. Take this cup and we say thank you for the greatness of the calling that you have called us to by the blood of Jesus. And so God, I pray for us this morning that we would be fastened to our anchor. That when we start to drift, we would feel that tug on our hearts calling us back to you. And that we would respond to that tug. That I pray for any hearts you're tugging on this morning, God. Hearts that are looking 
the things that we know lead to destruction, hearts that are just distracted by the cares and concerns of this world, or hearts that are just complacent and unaware that they're being swept up in the current, God. May you tug on them. May you bring them back to you today, God. God, I pray for anyone here this morning or anyone listening to these words that's just never put their trust, never put that, their hope in you, never had that anchor on their soul, God, that they would trust you, that they would hear the greatness of your love for them, the greatness of the message of your kingdom, and that they would want to follow you and trust you with their lives. And that they would tie that anchor to them and that you would keep them secure and safe in harbor with them. May you just be at work in all of our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray.